The message today, title is Just a Feeling. Uh, as you can probably guess from the children's message, it has something to do with how we feel about God and how God feels about us. And I think most of us could agree, especially us grown-ups, that there are times in our lives that we feel loved, and there are also times in our lives where we don't necessarily feel that. And it can all seem very conditional. Most, if not all, of the human earthly relationships we have are predicated on conduct and behavior, right? Aren't they? We may stay happily married as long as we treat our spouse a certain way and stay faithful. We may retain our friendships as long as we take pains throughout the years to keep in touch. In other words, if we do this and that, we will get such and such result. It is based on the fulfillment and the keeping of conditions. That's kind of what we're used to. Now I've noticed, however, that these type of conditional things and the way we work to keep all those things satisfied can result with this kind of anxiety. So we've all had this, that headache, middle of your forehead headache, right? That feeling of anxiety. And it's just a feeling, really, something inside of us that I think occasionally rears up its ugly head and says, boy, I hope I'm working hard enough to meet these demands, to keep this relationship going, whatever it is. It takes work and effort, and it can be, quite frankly, sometimes exhausting. So the question this morning is, is this the way God's promises work in the Bible also? Are his promises like everyone else's promises? Do we need to act perfect and say all the right things all the time in order to get God's approved stamp? Are there those conditions also that apply? I know sometimes some people seem to think so. Indeed, if you walk into some churches wearing the wrong clothes or anything, it can be a strike against you. I was told the following story from a person in our congregation, and I liked it so much I'm going to tell it again. There is a mega church in a large city somewhere in the United States, thousand plus people every Sunday, and one day a man came to church, came to service, and he didn't look, you know, quite right. He wasn't dressed real well, and he had kind of a kind of a smell to him in actuality. And so several weeks this went on, and finally a group of people came over to the pastor and they pulled him aside and they said, Pastor, this guy over here, I don't know what the deal is, we can't sit in the same row that he's sitting in. Hey, there's just some smells and stuff going on. And so the pastor says, okay, he calls this gentleman over. He says, we like having you at church, sir, but really I think what God's laying on my heart is to tell you to go get cleaned up for Jesus. Okay? How would you dress and how would you act if God were here in the church? This is what he says to the man. So the man says, okay. They go home Monday through Friday, Saturday. Sunday happens. The man comes back. He still doesn't smell too good. The clothes look the same. Nothing's changed. The pastor walks up to the man and he says, I thought we had a discussion about getting you cleaned up for church, for Jesus. The man says to the pastor, you know, I thought about it for a while. What would Jesus wear if he was in this church? And then it occurred to me he never came to this church. <laughs> Conditions. Conditional. If you wear this, people will treat you that way. If you do this, you will get that. But I would like to contend here this morning that when it comes to God's promises in the Bible, we aren't banking on just a feeling when it comes to God's love for us. And I would like to further maintain when it comes to God's promises, the hard work was already accomplished by him. We've seen the picture of the scales of justice, right? So once we figure out, I think, that God has done the work for us, the scales invert. It's out of balance. It changes the nature of our relationship with God, or at least it should. So I used to drive around. There's a uh, Back when I lived in Des Moines, there's a little neighborhood uh, tucked away called Beaverdale. Some of you might know where it's at. Yep, shaking heads. Good. So Beaverdale... Um, the houses aren't necessarily really fancy, but every Christmas time they have this incredible show of Christmas lights. And I don't know if they're still doing that 
now anymore or not, but it was something to see, folks. You didn't even have to pay anything. People, lines of cars would wind their way through this little neighborhood in Des Moines, and the, the Christmas lights would just be incredible. And I remember thinking, you know, this is someone else's hard work. Someone else went through all this trouble for us in these nice warm vehicles to drive around and look and take it in, okay? The balance of the scales was upset. We were in their debt. And it's humbling, isn't it? When we stop to think about it, the Christian faith is a story about a holy God coming down to man and not us trying to work our way up to God. It is different. And honestly, there will be times when we don't feel God's love in our life. Bad things happen to us. Unfair things happen. Now, I am often enthralled with the writings and the stories about Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Everyone knows there's hardly a greater example of sainthood to be found anywhere in the world. She was incredible. She took in the poor, the hungry, the sick. She tended to them. She gave faithfully of herself, had scarcely any personal wealth to speak of. God was her 401k. She was God's worker in a time of need. But yet she often wrote about something interesting called the dark night of the soul. Have you heard of this? It's Mother Teresa talking about times in her life when she felt empty, like she didn't have a connection with God. Mother Teresa? When God seemed distant or not there at all. Now, I can pretty much guarantee if Mother Teresa struggled with her faith time to time, you and I might also. So how do we counteract the dark night of the soul? When God seems distant and our faith seems strained? And I think one of the main things to remember is that we need to stay in the Word. We need to keep opening and reading the Bible. Keep listening to the Bible on the radio. As we thumb through its pages and we read scriptures like John 3.16, it's hard to see anything, in my opinion, other than a creator who loves us deeply. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Tell me this doesn't sound like a love letter. It's the Christmas story and the Easter story all rolled together in one. If we look back at the stories in the Old Testament, Israel kept messing up, and God forgave them over and over again. King David committed adultery, tried to have his mistress's husband murdered. Yet God called him a man after his own heart. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, insulted and abandoned Jesus on the cross, and Jesus prayed that his heavenly Father might forgive them because they knew not what they did. It, it's good to keep these truths in our minds, folks. Our God is a God of mercy, forgiveness, and love. Listen to this one, Hebrews 13.5. I read it a moment ago. I will never leave you nor forsake you. A short verse, but powerful. The God who made everything and everyone says that he will not ever forsake you. And we may count on that as true. As true as the promise that the sun will come up tomorrow. And this is the best part. It's true whether or not you and I feel like it's true. He loves us whether or not we notice it in our day-to-day -day lives, whether or not we are plugged into him. So much more than just a feeling. God is this reliable being, creator. Now, years ago, I worked at a place called a video store. They don't have them nowadays, though I think there's one in Atoma still. Okay, this is back in the days when you take tapes and put them in these things called VCRs, right? Um, and I worked there for years and years, and I finally made my way up to assistant manager or something. And uh, I worked with one of my friends. His name was Jeremy. Jeremy was very, 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 very reliable. You could set your watch to him. Okay? He stood out above all the other employees. Always there on time, always did his job, never left early, and on and on and on and on. And this stood in stark 
contrast to many of the other employees, okay? I remember one gentleman always had a darts tournament he had to get to, and so he had to leave early. And another person, it was bowling, I think, and then um, the one lady just constant calling in, you might get her one, one day a week, okay? And she was scheduled for three or four days. And, and so he stood out. God is this type of reliable, friends. Do you believe this? I hope you do. I know some of you do. Salvation, his salvation is open to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. This means if you repent of sin, you trust in Jesus, you will have the great privilege and opportunity of spending an eternity with the only being who will love you no matter what, all the time, forever, no conditions. Jesus has done the heavy lifting. As scripture says, his death on the cross finished the atonement for sin once and for all. Scripture says that right before he bowed his head, in fact, on the cross and gave up his spirit, he uttered the phrase, it is finished. What is finished? The work of the spirit, the atonement for sin, God's great act of love for you and I. Calvary was free, but it was not cheap. God extends this offer. We should accept the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. It is the final chapter in a celestial love letter written to you and I. A letter that isn't dependent on conditions and temporal demands. Now, how long will God's patient love for us endure? How long? After all, in a world where a million unborn children are put to death each year, where the love of many run cold, where God is often slandered and insulted, where lust and pornography run rampant, when will enough be enough? When will this holy, good God say, that's it? But if we look at Matthew 28, 20, what does it say about God's love? It says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Does this sound familiar? This is the part of the Bible known as the Great Commission, where Jesus instructs his, his followers to carry on the faith after he is gone. And he promises his help, the help of the Holy Spirit, until the end of all things. Now this type of love, friends, you can't ignore it, okay? The offer of Jesus is not something that you can ignore. You must answer it. You can ignore it for a while, but then it starts to work on you. Even though we don't see this type of love all the time in today's world, it is available to anyone who answers the call of Christ. And resting on the fact that God loves us is so much more than just a feeling. Emotions can come and go, but it appears that God remains steadfast in his position. His strength doesn't depend on our faithfulness. I'll say it again. His strength does not depend on our faithfulness. He says we are worth dying for. We are worth forgiving. We are worth saving. And in some ways, I believe this truth is the most important thing that anyone can take away from the Christian faith, the idea that we are loved and it will endure forever. Never will he leave us. Never will he forsake us. Always will he be with us, even until the end of the age, until the end of all things, when everyone else might disappoint us, when they break promises, not God. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid, friends, because there is so much white noise out there today, so many distractions, so much godless talk, envy, greed, strife, <laughs> violence, scary things. So many ideas competing for our attention. The world doesn't always remind us that we are worth saving, does it? Instead, it often talks about human overcrowding, overpopulation, too many of us, not enough resources, fear, fear, fear. Human life is often cheapened, disseminating and spreading anxiety. If you start to feel this way, if you start to feel that hopelessness when you look around, go back to the Bible, open it up, thumb through the pages that record the history of a holy God who became man, 
and went willingly to be crucified on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven. And then look me in the eye and tell me you don't feel loved. Will you pray over me? Father God, your promises are more than just a feeling. They are something we can bank on, something we can count on, even when it doesn't feel that way. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Your spirit endures forever. And you will be with us, like scripture says, until the very end of the age and the end of all things. We are so grateful for this truth, Lord. It is the ultimate thanksgiving gift. Thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.